This is a brief history of What okay. rate are you talking about? Well, I pay sixty-eight dollars a month. I said, so do you have your bill with you? And she said, yes. I said, can you tell me what's on the bill? And she goes, street utility for yes, blah blah. And I said, well, okay. And that cost is tripling is the sewer, the sewage treatment. So that nine dollars and seventy-seven okay. cents could go up to a little over thirty. 
Um, but the whole rest of the bill is not tripled. She goes, oh, I was so worried because I can't afford $180 a month. And, mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of people, are, the, the story didn't, and the headline definitely didn't help with that. Yeah. So we'll be talking about interim. That was probably intended. Yeah, so tonight, <laughs> yes. So I was just thinking, you know, if there was some like employee who worked, I don't know, like the city of Bedford or something, you know, and they had like lots of vacation girl stuff and they thought, you know what would be really fun? I don't know if John's hearing me. I'm not hearing you. Okay. I was thinking like if there was like some season in place that you know what I've never done? I've never been a city interim city manager for a small town coming back from a big fire. That would be fun. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. Just yeah. If you're if that's your definition of fun, I'm a little worried about you. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody interested in the button answer? Yes. 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 Um, so, according to one popular theory, no one really knows the facts, but according to one popular theory, it, it comes from the Victorian days when women were dressed by servants and that. According to this theory, um, the buttons were on the opposite side than men's to make it easier for servants to button up their employees' dresses right. Hmm. It's an interesting theory. I uh, I thought men had servants as well, though. Then I mean, I watch too many movies. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, perfect. And so, may I just a quick check on attendance today? On the buyer, um, I have not heard from, so I do expect her. And Dave said he'll be a, a bit late tonight. Yeah. So um, we just uh, talked about in the absence of a quorum, we'll open, close, and have a presentation. So I'll wait a couple more minutes and then we'll just. It doesn't sound like we're going to have a quorum, so. Hey, John, is there a written report on um, what you're going to be presenting today? It's just a, the presentation, but Jordan has it, so she can provide it to you if she hasn't already. Okay, great. Most of what's in there in the presentation is what I would put in a, in a written report anyway for now. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead um, and... Uh, call this meeting to order of um, August 2nd, the st uh, study session for talent, City of Talent. Roll call, please. Here. Here. Okay, so without a quorum, we'll go ahead and close the meeting, uh, the study session of August 2nd, the City of Talent. And do yeah. we need to have this on? Um, there is some audience members tonight. There's some what? Audience members via Zoom. Okay. And so I will ask uh, for those that wanna stay voluntarily to just listen to the presentation by John and Ryan to stay, but let's keep them on, at least for our presenters so that folks online can hear as well. Great. Okay, we can do that. Well, I will share screen and we will do the presentation. So, <clears throat> Mayor um, and Council members, have, we appreciate the opportunity to share with you an update on the regional wastewater um, facility and some large increases in fees that are going to be um, uh, coming here in the next several years in order to, for us to stay in compliance with the permit. And what I what I want to do and what Ryan and I would like to do is to give a little background, basically how did we get here? What what's what's occurred to get us in this position, what we're doing to to deal with, with the with the position that we're in. And then um, Ryan's going to cover basically how we're going to finance this and um, to complete the project. So, you know, the bottom line is significant upgrades to the plant are required, and we wanted to get this on your radar now. It is not going to be cheap. And as I mentioned, we wanted to just cover some, basically, how did we get here, and then the financing portion of it. 
So the overview of the, the regional wastewater reclamation facility. So the, 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 this facility serves all of the Bear Creek drainage. So pretty much all of the cities that, um, that were the drainage in which the city resides um, goes to Bear Creek um, is served by this facility, except Ashland. Ashland's the only one that's not in there. So Talent, Phoenix, Jacksonville, Central Point, and Medford are all part um, that uh, their effluent goes to the regional water um, reclamation facility. In addition to that, Eagle Point does as well. All of White City, which um, taken in, in, in aggregate is a fairly large community, you know, approaching, you know, eight to 10,000 people. Um, and then we have several unincorporated areas between the cities um, that are also hooked up to the regional um, system. Um, the population served today is about 160,000, a little bit over that, and it's projected to go about 212,000 into the future. This map just shows the boundary area of the Rogue Valley Sanitary Sewer, and that's all the area that does drain to the um, regional reclamation facility. You can see Eagle Point in there, um, White City, Central Point, Jacksonville, Medford, and then the talent, the Phoenix and Talent as well. And you can see the little um, sewage lines that go north and south of, of your community. Those areas also go to the regional reclamation facility. So just a little bit of history, the, this facility was, um, the city took it over in 1948. This used to, the White City area used to be Camp White and Camp White was a very large military base. As many people know, that military base had its own sewage treatment plant and we took it over, the city took it over in 1948. Pretty much the entire plant was reconstructed in 1970 and then there's been significant additions and expansions um, since that point. We treat about 18 million gallons of waste every single day. That number can increase um, during winter storms significantly. Um, so the average flow is about 18 million gallons, but it's not uncommon to see 60 or 70 million gallons um, in the winter time flowing through the plant. That is, a, that is a lot of effluent that's flowing through that facility. The treatment that we use there are pretty traditional um, treatments. We do primary and secondary treatment with disinfection right before it enters the Rogue River. And so basically the secondary treatment um, is a suspended growth and activated sludge. And don't wanna to get too technical, but basically what that is, is it's using microorganisms, it's using natural processes, and in, in just putting it in the, 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 the plainest of terms, we're farming bugs and we're farming microorganisms that eat the, 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 uh, the waste materials that when people flush, that's where it goes. And we're farming those, those, uh, those uh, microorganisms, keeping them healthy so they can process. And that's the primary treatment that we do. The solids that we remain, we send to an anaerobic digester and it's basically a big vessel where that sludge goes and, the micro, and there's a different set of microorganisms in, in there that, that uh, digest and eat the, the sludge and what remains is taken to the landfill. Um, I would note that, that that solids treatment produces a lot of methane and we collect that methane and we burn it in a cogeneration plant to power the facility. So we, we, we recycle that material in a sense. So this is just a, a snapshot of, of the facility itself. The areas there in purple is the, 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 the headworks and the um, uh, grit chamber. And it's the first treatment, it's screening large material. Number five there is the primary treatment. Everything in the yellow is the secondary treatment. And then it goes to what you see in the blue, uh, numbers 22 and 23 and a, number 11. And that's where it discharges, it's treated. It's uh, treated with uh, chlorine. And then we can't discharge chlorine to the Rogue River because it's very toxic to fish. So we treat it again with a bisodium uh, product and it strips the chlorine out. So it's safe to put into the river. And then all those other um, um, large areas you see are um, lagoons where we, we store the sludge and then we dry the sludge before we take it to the landfill. So one of the reasons that we're, we're here is because in, 19, um, or in uh, 2018, the Northwest Environmental Act, um, Advocates, NWA, brought a lawsuit against the city. And they were claiming that the city was in violation of the Clean Water Act because of algae growth in the river, impacts to the biologic community, odor, foaming, et cetera. And really what this was about had more to do with NWA was very critical of DEQ, feeling like DEQ wasn't enforcing the permit to a level that they should have been. 
probably less against the city, but they were very critical of DEQ. DEQ repeatedly was his event on record. The city has never been in violation of our permit then or now. We have not ever violated our permit, but NWA was very aggressive in this action. That lawsuit is currently stayed pending the upgrade of our permit. And you're gonna see how this um, relates here in a second. So the Federal Clean Water Act prohibits us from discharging any pollutants into waters of the state. And the Rogue River is clearly a water of the state. And so it's, it's against the law to put any pollutants in there. Well, when that act was passed in the 1970s, it was recognized that municipal um, uh, treatment plants, large industrial operations, there's only so much you can do. And so some pollution has to be allowed. And so what the N NPDES permit system does, it says you're allowed to discharge this much, but you're not allowed to discharge this much. This, this uh, pollutant can only be at this level, this, this pollutant has to be below this level. So it's a permit that regulates all that kind of stuff. We had a permit in place. Uh, the last one was issued in December of 2011, and that permit actually expired in 2016. When it expired, it's the, the conditions stay into effect. This is one of the issues that NWA had with the with DEQ is this, if this permit expired and DEQ, why don't you issue the city a new permit? And why are you letting them operate under this old permit? Throughout this time period, the city was always in compliance with the, with the permit. So here's what changed everything. In 2021, in August, DEQ issued us a new NPDES permit, and that permit required significant reductions in nitrogen and phosphorus and reductions in temperature. And when I say significant, I'm talking in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 percent reductions of what the previous permit did. The problem with that is our current plant is completely incapable of meeting that permit condition. We said there's no way to tweak the existing plant to meet that condition. Um, so that is a very high standard. It's a high enough standard. The city was very concerned about the cost and, and our ability to meet that. And so we appealed the permit and we said this is too stringent. This is not going to be fair to the, the rate payers. NWA also appealed the permit and said, um, DEQ, you're not nearly stringent, stringent enough. You guys didn't go nearly far enough. You need to dial this down even further. And so in December of last year, a judge made a ruling. And basically what the judge says, you're both wrong. City, this is not an unreasonable permit condition. Comply with it. NWA, the permit is not too lax. It's appropriate for the conditions. So it's fine. So basically the permit stands as issued. And so in a sense, we both lost, but where the city's at is now we have to comply with the permit. So in the permit, the, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality recognized that there was no way for our current plant to meet these permit conditions. They understood that our current plant couldn't do this. So they required a significant upgrade to the plant as part of the permit. So Next month, we're required to submit a new facility plan to DEQ to say, here's what it's going to take to upgrade the plant. After that, we have to submit a preliminary design, which is basically the start of the detailed design of the plant next year. Two years after that, we have to submit a final design, which is basically plans and specifications ready to build a new plant. Um, and then, then we have to do so. By 2028, we have to have the new plant constructed and completely built. And then by 2030, we have to be meeting all new permit conditions. That's a pretty aggressive schedule for a facility, of, uh, an upgrade of this significance. So to, to do this, we contracted with a couple of um, uh, engineering firms that specialize in wastewater treatment plants. The facility plan is wrapping up. It'll be submitted to DEQ next uh, month per our permit condition. And it answers the question, what, is, what do we need to do to the plant to meet these permit conditions? This study really um, um, analyzed a broad range of alternatives, different technologies, different costs in order for us to do this. And so as we did this, there was three different alternatives that were, uh, were studied. Alternative one is what I would call basically a traditional approach. It's, it's the same, it's essentially the same technologies that we're using in the plant today, but it's greatly expanded. And the way that that treats the water is the longer those microorganisms can chomp on the, the waste stream, the more they'll clean it up. And so this large expansion is basically a similar technology that we have today, but it's slowing the process down so it gets treated to a much higher level. But you can see in this graphic, 
anything in, um, in, in blue is new. And so if you look at the existing facilities and everything in blue, you can see this is a significant upgrade. I mean, it's almost doubling the size of the plant in some respects. In addition, we're adding some, um, some disinfection chambers and some additional techniques to, to, to treat it. But largely, it's a similar process. Does it increase the capacity as well? Yes, it does. And it, the capacity is increased to deal with the 2045 projected flows. The second alternative that, that we um, uh, paid a lot of attention to, it was kind of a finalist, you'd say, was a, 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 a system called AGS. And AGS is um, uh, activated granular um, solids. This is a proprietary system. A company owns this technology. It's used in um, uh, uh, Europe quite a bit. Um, and it is uh, what I would call kind of a black box technology. It's, it's proprietary. They kind of own the rights on how it works. Um, it does produce some very clean water and it was one of the finalists that we used. And I'll talk about why we didn't pursue this one in a second. And then the last alternative was that was kind of a finalist is what we call alternative number five. It's the traditional approach. Plus we added MBR and an MBR basically is a whole series of membranes or filters that we pass the effluent through. This produces very clean water. It's a very good technology, also pretty popular. Um, uh, but in the end, we picked alternative one and I'll show you why. So alternative one, these are some older figures, but the proportionally they are still good. So alternative one is suspended growth, secondary clarifiers. And you can see that workshop number six the estimated cost of between 120 million and 250 million. AGS, the estimated cost was 145 to 3, 3, 320. And then the MBR plus the, the uh, traditional approach was 100 million to 120 million. So you can see number one was sec basically the second most expensive. The AGS system was clearly the most expensive in terms of initial investment. And then the MBR um, was kind of, uh, was, was the cheapest. When you add though, that bottom section there that notes that's the, the uh, total chemical cost, total energy cost, and the maintenance and operations of the facility, you can see that um, the, the MBR system is very expensive, three times, more than three times the other ones. So on a life cycle cost, that becomes a very expensive plant to operate. The AGS system was a little bit cheaper. Um, it was kind of uh, comparable with the suspended growth. But in the end, we selected alternative one as the best alternative for that life cycle cost that we talked about, the initial cost. And then one of the biggest factors is this is a system that is very popular. This is the most popular system of wastewater treatment across the nation. So there's lots of people that know how to do this. And so when, we're, when we need to find operators, there's people that we can find that, that kind of help, out, help us operate the plant. So that was the recommended project that we are moving forward with at this time. So the last slide before I turn it over to Ryan is this, this graph just shows the different stages. And I talked about those timeframes, but the takeaway on that is the bottom portion of this shows some costs. When you add all those costs up in today's dollars, the cost of, of this upgrade is estimated to, at um, $223 million. To, to complete this. And that's in today's dollars. So that doesn't count um, the inflation that we know is gonna happen over the next several years before we have to build this. It doesn't factor in a lot of contingencies. And so in today's dollars, 223, but we're telling people it's gonna cost more than that to make sure that we cover ourselves and we um, bond adequately. So I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan and Ryan's gonna walk us through basically now that I gave you all this wonderful news that it's gonna cost 223 plus what are we going to do now? So, <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and Council, Ryan Martin, Medford CFO and Deputy City Manager. Um, and, you know, pointing out kind of the, the financing plan on the Gantt chart that John provided. Um, initially, there are, there are some benefits to this in that all the financing does not have to happen at one time. Um, we're hoping that in a couple of years, interest rates decline a bit, um, that we get a little bit more favorable interest rates as we're looking at financing likely over 30 years. Um, a small interest rate reduction can actually make a pretty big impact overall for a 30 year period of time. 
Um, so we're looking at financing this in a couple of ways. So the first one is WIFIA, which is the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act. It's um, it's by the EPA, and um, the benefit to this is well, there's a couple benefits. Number one is a lot of times interest rates can be lower um, than traditional issuing of revenue bonds. Um, so that's one benefit. Also, um, there's a little bit more favorable payback period. So sometimes you don't have to pay start paying back until five years until or five years after the project is done. Um, one of the drawbacks is that it's it can only cover 49% of the project, um, where revenue bonds could cover the entire project. Also, there are um, it's a negotiation period or a negotiation between the EPA and the city where we don't know exactly what the interest rates are going to be, the payback terms. It's all a negotiation at the end. Um, and so we're looking at kind of leveraging that with revenue bonds because we know we can issue revenue bonds for whatever the entire project cost is. Um, and we'll look at um, the entire project cost over the 30 years. So, um, for example, um, with WIFIA, they could have more favorable payback terms um, and lower interest rates, but they also have federal requirements that we have to adhere to, like the Buy America, Build America, where a certain portion of the project has to be, um, we have to purchase supplies from the United States, um, and that could actually push the project cost up. So we're going to weigh all this as we go along. Um, one thing I told the other cities in our council is that we never like to come forward and say, we're asking for any money, but let alone $300 um, million with inflation and contingency with so many unknowns. But the unfortunate thing is there are a lot of unknowns at this time because we don't know where interest rates are going to be. Um, projects of this magnitude never seem to go quite according to plan. And so um, sometimes uh, there's fi different financing needed at different times. So um, what we can guarantee is that we're going to try to minimize the impact to the ratepayers. Um, so as we mentioned, um, because the project happens at different uh, different times, we're not looking to issue bonds for $300 million tomorrow and increase the rates by the amount that they're going to have to increase by. We're going to borrow the money when we need it. Um, so the initial, um, as far as the chart goes, uh, the initial $20 million um, is likely going to be issued in this biennium. Um, and then after that, as we look forward two to three years, and the rest of the money is needed, that's when we're kind of hoping that interest rates decrease. Um, so our timeline right now is tomorrow, um, our, we're bringing to our city council the bonding authorization resolution. Um, this is a resolution to approve up to $300 million. Um, we're estimating with inflation and contingency, we're probably more around $280 million. Um, but there's a 60 day waiting period um, after it's published in the paper, which will be on August 4th. Um, so there's that waiting period before we can really continue um, with a lot of this. And so um, to avoid potentially having to go back through that, we are um, looking to have our council authorize a little bit more than we think that we're going to need. Um, on, August, on October 3rd, possibly sooner, we're looking at having a letter of intent submitted to WIFIA. Um, it's kind of an odd process and that you have to submit a letter of intent, which is a lot of the technical documents and engineering. And after that, if they approve that, then they formally allow you to apply. So this is not even the application for it. Um, so in March or earlier, we're looking at having the WIFIA application submitted. Um, and then in June of 2024, we're looking at likely issuing the first revenue bonds. Hopefully WIFIA will be approved at that time and we can kind of choose between which one's more advantageous um, for this project. Uh, and then in June uh, or July of 26 and July of 28 is when we would likely issue the second and third bonds or second and third loans from WIFIA. Um, the unfortunate part uh, that none of us like is the utility rate increases that are going to be needed um, to help pay for this project. On everybody's sewer bill, there's two different fees. There's the sewer collection fee and there's the sewer treatment fee. So just to be clear, that entire bill is not going to triple, um, but there is likely a 300% increase in the sewer treatment portion. In the city of Medford and Rogue Valley Sewer, so Rogue Valley Sewer covers part of Medford and then all of the surrounding cities and unincorporated areas that utilize um, this plant. The Sewer treatment fee is the same for all of those. So it's $9.79 per month for a single family residence. Um, the estimated sewer treatment rate at the completion of the project is going to be over $30. Um, so this is not something that we like to 
um, present. We dislike it as much as anybody else, but unfortunately it's just um, the nature of the situation that we're in. So um, that's going to happen over probably the next um, six to eight years, possibly with some of the WIFIA financing, if we can start paying back later um, without having to pay interest, then the rates could be um, could trail off a little bit more into the future, so maybe 10 years into the future. But that's all we have to present. Um, John and I are happy to answer any hard-hitting questions that you may have. Brian, I have a question. Yes. Hector, is my mic hot now? Sorry, I took it down for all the interference. Um, Ryan, are these utility rate increase estimates based off of Medford getting the WIFIA loan, or is this in the event that the WIFIA loan is not granted or accepted? Um, this was using this was using a fairly conservative interest rate, not knowing what the WIFIA interest rate might be. Uh, so even with revenue bonds a year from now, we have no idea what they might be. But we're looking at about a four and a half percent interest rate um, over the thirty years. So it it could be a combination of both. We just we have no way to know what that interest rate might be. Uh, what I will say is it does include um, it includes inflation for the project, includes the additional employees that are needed to operate the plant. Um, with the much larger footprint, there are more employees that will be needed. It includes the total cost of compensation for all those employees, so the salary um, and the benefits, and also inflation over time for those employees as well. It, the other thing that it also does, it adds some contingencies to the project, because um, you know we, we know projects like this never go as planned, and so we added some additional um, costs in there as well, because we know that stuff's going to pop up. So is it safe to say that if interest rates are lower than four and a half percent, our talent users can expect a lower increase to their bill, or if the interest rates are higher than four and a half percent, they might see a higher increase to their bill? Yes, that would be accurate. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so how, how is this going to be phased in? Is it going to be just boom, 30 bucks, or uh, how, how, how is that going to be phased in? Um, good question. So the um, the first portion of it, back up to this chart, um, the initial rate increases, so let's say for maybe the next two years, are going to be fairly minimal. So $20 million out of um, the $221 million in today's dollars will happen in this biennium. Um, and then as we look forward into fall of 2026, that's when the bulk of the project needs to start and the bulk of the funding um, will need to be issued via bonds or loans. So I would say um, for the next two to three years, minimal impacts, um, then it'll start to go up pretty significantly, um, probably in 2026 to 2028. Well, one thing I would add is um, when we increased, our, um, the city of Medford increased our sewer collection fee, we did an analysis just last year and we did an analysis, a comparison to all other cities, um, not all every city in Oregon, but a huge majority of the cities in Oregon, we took a look at, and our sewer collection fee was amongst the lowest in the entire, in the state. It was very, very low. At $30, it kind of puts us in the middle of the pack. We're not the highest, we're not the lowest, we're kind of average now. And so it, that's a big increase. As Ryan said, none of us like go feel wonderful about that, that ratepayers are gonna to have to um, pay that. But I would note that in comparison to many other cities, this is pretty, a pretty average um, treatment fee. Now try to sell that to you know, like the ratepayers and make them feel good, I get that. It does. <laughs> um, and also, I guess we can't expect, you know, the, you know, people think, oh, once the thing's been built, the money's been spent and recouped and everything, but that's the maintenance. Well, the, the, the rates aren't going to go down from $30 at any point as a result of the completion of the project or paying off the bond. Is that right? I don't see them going down. Yeah. No. Until they, they should stabilize yeah. $30 for. I mean, until the bond's paid off, which, you know, we don't even know that term yet, but like that's going to be 30 years, right? Yeah. Well, we don't like, know. Yeah. yeah. We're not sure yet. Yeah. Okay. But by that time, you know, other inflationary factors will influence the plan. I would be surprised if we could ever lower it um, because by the time the bonds paid off, there's going to be a bunch of other factors influencing the cost. Um, there's a question on timing. You know, recognize that this is because there's new permit requirements um, for the EPA. This will be built in 2030, matching capacity in 2045. Does the design of this facility also incorporate 
potential additional requirements by the EPA down the road? Or will we have to face potentially another expansion or change to the facility after 2045? So as far as additional things that I have no idea what they're gonna issue in five years, it doesn't do that. But uh, there was some phosphorus limits that they were kind of on the fence for. We incorporated those things into the plant to make sure that we could to, to deal with those. There were some of those things that we kind of got a hint, let's make sure that we treat at this level to protect ourselves. But if they if something pops up in the future that I don't know about, well, I, I mean, for example, I think a lot of people have heard about PFOS. Um, they're called forever chemicals and it's becoming talked about more and more. Um, this plant can't treat PFOS and frankly, no plants in the, it can, can treat PFOS right now. And so something that was to pop up tomorrow that says you have to treat PFOS, this plant won't do it. Um, but nobody, nobody else can either. And we're going to have to figure out how to do it. So, so I think we're, we have some contingency built in for potential things that DEQ might do, but I can't, I don't know what the, all of them are. So I, I could never say, yeah, we're going to be fine for the next 30 years. Can I ask a, a kind of a related question? Um, so with these upgrades um, that you're doing, uh, the objective is to meet the meet the standards that are being imposed. Um, will the uh, work that's being done enable the plant to do uh, to to reach higher standards if that becomes the case? Absolutely. So I'll give you an example. We and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but. Um, this is relative. So we have to remove um, in the neighborhood of 75 to 80% of total suspended solids. And so it's total suspended solids are the little floaters you have in the water. And we have to remove you know, some in the neighborhood of 75 to 80% of those per the permit. We currently remove about 97 to 98%. We have, we're, we're well exceeding the permit. This plant would continue that practice where the standards here, we're gonna be able to treat it here. So if they increase that, we would be good for a while. Now, if they said 100%, then this plant would, but, you know, they, they can't do that because nobody knows how to, to remove everything. So is it a capacity issue then, generally? I mean, it sounds to me like it currently can meet those standards. Um, is, is this extra um, building that needs to happen have anything to do with capacity? No, it's not a, well, I mean, it's a capacity. Um, uh, I touched on this a little bit during the presentation. So we don't have a capacity problem with the plant today. It, we're meeting all permit conditions. We're treating all the effluent and meeting the permit conditions and, 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 and adhering to that. But the way that the, the recommended alternative, what it's doing is we're allowing those microorganisms longer to process the, the waste stream. So we're adding a whole bunch of capacity to the plant to basically allow those microorganisms to chomp on the, the waste for a lot longer time period. And that's, that's how you get this increased um, treatment. And so we're adding a, a whole new aeration tank. They're adding six new um, secondary clarifiers. We're just adding a whole bunch of additional treatment. And so is that a capacity issue? Yes, but it's really being done to, to provide um, a greater level of treatment. Got Does that it. make sense? It can Mary? spend more time on the land. Is it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you think about like, you know, scrubbing your floor, the more you scrub it, the cleaner it is. And that's kind of what this is doing. Gotcha. Thanks for thanks for that clarification. I didn't catch it in the presentation. So um, as far as so we're pr pretty much deciding y'all decided to stay with the current technology <laughs> versus some of these other technologies. And one of the reasons was is because it is the most popular in the US. So people know how to do it. I'm wondering if you looked at, um, if you did any uh, comparison and see which of the technologies is there, if any of them are um, gaining more popularity more rapidly, which might indicate that they are like the technology of the future for whatever reason. So, so I think that, you know, the, the one is that AGS system is, is kind of talked about maybe a technology of the future. There's there's only like three or four that's the European one. That's the European one. And there's yeah. only like three or four plants in the United States that are doing this right now. It's not a it's it's not popular at all. Um, and in Europe, it's not even that popular. It, it's there's a, a lot more of them in Europe than there are in the United States, but it's not something like this is the primary technology in Europe, not by a long shot. Okay. Um, MBR, which is that membrane filter, which was alternative five, 
Um, that's really not a new technology that's been around a long time and it does produce some very clean water, but it is just so expensive to operate. It is horribly expensive to operate. And, it, and I think from life cycle costs and looking out for the rate payers, that one really scares us because it, it might be the cheapest in infrastructure today, but when you take a 20 year cost, are we really treating our rate payers right? I, I don't know if that answers your question, Eleanor. We, we looked at, you know, the consultant looked at a whole bunch of stuff and these were kind of the three winners. AGS is kind of that new cool one that some people talk about, but it's it, it makes us nervous because it's proprietary and it's kind of black box and it's not very popular. Okay, great. Well, I love the little Sean verse, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Donna Ryan, what's the best way for us to let our community members know to follow along on the project to get updates? So we, we will be keeping, I mean, just like today, we're going to try our best to keep the, because I mean, you represent, you know, this elected body represents all the ratepayers in your city. So we want to do everything we can to keep you informed. That's why we had the meeting last month. We want to continue to do outreach every time there's a significant milestone to update you. And so we'll be doing some reach out. And then I guess I'd ask you, Jordan, what do you need from us to help you keep your the ratepayers and your your citizens informed? Yeah, well, I'll share. You know, always welcome and always uh, love having you guys here to share the information directly so that the council can ask questions. If you guys have a project website or anything like that, please send it our way. We'll push it out in our city communication so that community members can follow along too. Okay. Um, you know, we're here to help community know what's coming, um, also to help to support the process and make sure the project gets done so that we can meet the requirements to keep sure. our waterways clean. Regional rate committee too. And the regional rate committee, you know, so Rogue Valley Sewer represents talent at the regional rate committee um, to, to help set these rates. So um, uh, I would clearly lean on Carl Tappert and um, RVSS to also keep you informed on that. Great. Dave Lama? Uh, just curious, uh, is the Rogue Valley kind of alone in this fix or are there other cities in, in Oregon or, or the Northwest who are facing similar kind of more stringent standards that have to be met. So Dave, thanks for that question because I, I, I didn't touch on it um, much in my presentation. You know, I talked about the lawsuit and there's no question that the lawsuit influenced DEQs, how aggressive they were. I think that's pretty obvious that, you know, that DEQ was sensitive to the lawsuit. They were trying to, you know, balance the needs. And so they were aggressive in this permit. That being said, Nitrogen and phosphorus levels are being dialed down everywhere. Every every one of these new NPDES permits that is coming out, there we're seeing reduced levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and nitrogen and phosphorus are, are key polluters in terms of growing algae and in the river and everything else. And so they're dialing that down pretty much across the board. We had we have one of the bigger ones. Ours is a, a pretty dandy one, but we're seeing that lots of places. So is there, if I may, is there any, any prospect of some additional help from the state or for the feds uh, with these costs to meet these stricter standards? We have continued to ask that question. We took a trip back to Washington, D.C. and last March and met with EPA to ask that specific question. Um, uh, they didn't say hell no, but uh, it was pretty close to that. Um, it was, um, uh, we're not finding a lot of grant programs and a lot of assistance beyond the, the low interest roads, the WIFIA loans, and they were quick to do that. And they have a lot of money in the WIFIA program right now that they were very positive that we would be a strong candidate for that. So we're feeling pretty positive. But as far as grants and just outright um, allocations, there's not much out there for that. And at the state level, there's very little. Well, if I may comment, I do, I, I do know that getting that lower interest rate can make a big difference. So that's a help. Yes. So so it's gonna be uh, RVSS that actually does the rate increase. Um, they'll pass it, it's basically a pass through to them. And they're a service district and they, you know, they uh, are completely funded uh, by the rate payers, although they, they could charge um, the pro a property tax if they wanted to, because they're a service district, but they chose not to. Right. Has there been any conversation about them actually maybe looking towards um, picking up uh, another source of revenue like property tax? Um, 
we have not had that conversation um, with RBS, and I don't know if that's something they're considering or not, but that's a very interesting question that uh, I, uh, I didn't, in all honesty, I didn't know that RBS could do that in terms of property tax. And so I'll, uh, I'll, I I'll ask. they can, and that yeah. they just chose not to after okay. a certain point to make it completely funded by the rate payers. Carl knows, I, this is my memory of a conversation with Carl. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Carl about that. Yeah, I mean, they may not have an appetite for it, but it might be, you know, right. um, uh, a way, a different, a different approach. Yeah, okay, thank you. I have just one more question about the financing, Ryan. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to um, paying as we borrow. Um, it, was there um, was there any discussion about incrementally raising the rates until until we get there, and then is that allowed? And 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 then banking some of that, so not as much borrowing needs to happen at uh, with and not really. No, uh, not as much borrowing means that some of that money has no interest rate, right? So was there any discussion about that? Um, well, we know we don't have to incrementally do it. With that said, if we were to borrow, let's say more money up, by, up front, um, you have, typically have a certain period of time that you can use it um, as you gain, as you, as you earn interest on it. Um, there's complex issues where you have to pay back money to the federal government if you earn more interest than the rate that you borrow at. Um, so to make it more simplistic in that term, in those terms, also to minimize the impact, uh, we know we're probably gonna have to issue at least two times. Um, so that initial one of $20 million where uh, the rates would increase a little bit for that. What we have looked at is for that um, second large chunk, there's a possibility that we can do the projects that are in green on this screen um, concurrently with the ones that are in this blue color right here. Um, so we'd have to do one less bond issuance. But um, the fact of the matter is the bond issuance costs are not really that much in um, proportion to the project. Um, it's probably less than $100,000 per issuance for you know a, almost $300 million um, borrowing. So um, I don't know if I completely answered your question. Yeah, you know what I was thinking about is I remember when the Duff treatment plant was talking about doing a second treat Duff two, and they were they were considering raising the rates as they headed towards the project. I might be remembering this wrong, but it seemed, um, and they were going to do it incrementally. And it seemed uh, the the reason for that was so that uh, by the time they got there, they would have um, it's sort of that savings account mentality rather than the credit card kind of a thing, and um, or borrowing and and paying back. Um, and I don't. I, I just was wondering if it was um, if it was um, it was a matter of it not being allowed to to do that or or maybe I just don't remember the the approach that Duff was taking on that. Well, do you remember, John? I I don't, but I would add that in July one, um, RBS did raise rates. And they raised them ten percent. And 5% was to cover the inflation of, of the plant, but 5% was also um, in a, a dedicated fund for future upgrades of the plant. So we have started that a little bit. I mean, it's 5% increase over the existing rate. So it's not a huge amount of money, but we have started that to some degree. Yeah, well, I trust that you have um, you know, vetted this out. Um, and that's not, I definitely don't wanna give that impression. I just, um, I'm just curious of what's allowed and what's not allowed, you know, and um, uh, good presentation. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thanks for having, thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, Ryan. Hector, do you want to stay logged in and just go to dark arm mics? Great.